Last year, we did a presentation on Timely uh, at the Accumulus Summit as well. So if Timely is something that's entirely new to all of you, or some of you, uh, definitely recommend looking at the video we did last year. Uh, Dave Marion, Jim Klukar, and myself uh, did a nice intro to Timely and, and some of the details of what it can do. So I'm just going to talk through what it is and what it's all about really briefly, and then linger on what we have done in the second year of Timely's existence, talk about how we've uh, implemented the architecture for large-scale systems and uh, some of the analytics we've built on top of it. So Timely is basically a massive time series database built on Accumulo. Uh, we started it because OpenTSDB didn't meet our needs. So uh, it was a good foundation. Uh, it largely adheres to the OpenTSDB API, so you can see some of the things later on where we will use the OpenTSDB data source for Grafana interchangeably. Uh, we have SSL TLS access to all aspects of the data that's either being written or stored or read. Uh, we have metric level access controls, which means you can uh, take advantage of Accumulo's cell level security mechanism uh, to protect the metrics that you write to, to, uh, to Timely. Uh, a number of different transports it supports for getting data in and out, including all you see on the screen there. Um, and it works with CollectD, which, and I'll talk about that in a second uh, when we go through the architecture. And a lot of the data can be consumed via a Grafana app, which is a tool for visually uh, exploring uh, time series data. But then also we provide a query API and subscription API to access the data in Timely uh, programmatically. So let's talk a little bit about how we scaled Timely out this year. Um, what you see on this slide is sort of a typical fan-in architecture. When you have a large number of data sources generating a fair amount of information, uh, you can't have a connection per data source writing to basically your store. So we've employed NSQD and, a, and another couple components uh, to basically fan in data from a large number of machines to write to one Accumulo instance. Uh, so just to talk about some of the key architectural components here, we have CollectD, which is sitting on each of the machines that we're monitoring. CollectD is really neat because it has a series of both input and output plugins uh, you can use for collecting data across boxes. You can do everything, you know, like the usual suspects like CPU, I.O., disk, disk utilization, uh, but even, even some low-level hardware monitoring things through IPMI, such as, you know, hard drive temperatures and things like that. Uh, the nice thing, it's a variety of different sources of information, but it's all expressed in a consistent way so that it becomes really easy to collect and manage a wide variety of different types of data. All these collectees feed into a series of NSQD agents, right? We have HA proxy between the collectees and NSQDs used to balance traffic between collectee and NSQ. Uh, then we have a simple, uh, uh, simple component called an NSQD pipe that basically their only job is to read from NSQD, which is like a queuing infrastructure, uh, and then write directly to Timely. And once again, we use another HA proxy instance to write to Timely instances that are specifically geared for write loads, right? So the loads distributed among those write instances, and each of those are writing to T servers in the Accumulo stack uh, via the live ingest, right? To get data out, we have a number of timely instances that are configured specifically for read. Uh, and HA proxy balances between those read instances. Uh, and then we have browsers running Grafana or something along those lines that will be consuming data or, or other clients. So um, a couple of the things we experimented with or will be experimenting with in the near future. Um, actually, the, the read and write partitioning for the timely instances isn't something that's in production today. But it's something we anticipate doing pretty soon. Uh, right now, all of the HA proxy instances are actually the same physical box, same physical process, uh, and we anticipate, you know, when we identify that that becomes a bottleneck, we can break that out across multiple boxes pretty easily. Ah, so one more point about CollectD is that things like Accumulo and Hadoop, whether it be the, you know, HDFS or either some applications or something like that, all can write to CollectD as well. So there's a number of different existing plugins, for instance, for Hadoop that allow you to send data through CollectD. Uh, CollectD also implements uh, the StatsD API, which uh, a number of different things that generate metrics can write to easily. But the long and short of it is, is, is once again, this is the fan in architecture. 
where where you have a large number of boxes on the left hand side of the slide slowly writing to I mean channeled down into a few high volume data streams on the on the right hand side. So part of identifying an effective fan in architecture is basically identifying the ratios of machines in each tier of that architecture. Um, we're finding that uh, 15 to 30 collectee clients per NSQ broker worked well for us based on the size of machines we're working with. And then from that next tier, uh, 8 to 15 NSQ brokers per timely server, right? And as I mentioned, we're using a single HA proxy for all of them. Uh, when planning out this architecture, it's really important for us to consider this notion of keeping up versus catching up. Keeping up just basically means that we can consume all the metrics that are being generated by the system at any one particular point in time. Catching up is when we encounter a failure to be able to consume those metrics that might have queued at some part of the infrastructure. Uh, very often we find ourselves on the edge of being to able to catch up, but it's worthwhile when thinking about planning. So those ratios should give you a basic uh, capability of catching up if you ever get behind for some reason, but uh, there are definitely cases where, uh, you know, in certain types of failures or certain durations of failures, we've had to drop data. Considering that it's system metrics data, it's not entirely, uh, 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 you know, critical, uh, and we kind of feel that way in general about the, the metrics data. Like, there are some aspects of it that are more important than others, but in in general, uh, if we drop metrics here and there, it's not the end of the world. Uh, so in this architecture, very often we find the bottleneck tends to be the insert rate into Accumulo. And so as a result, there's a number of different tricks we've played with Accumulo to help increase that insert rate. Uh, some of the basics are running with write-ahead logs disabled. Uh, once again, this is metrics data, so durability isn't the highest concern. So re writing, uh, running with write-ahead logs uh, definitely increases, uh, disabled definitely increases the uh, insert rate into Accumulo. Other techniques involve decreasing the replication of the, the R files that Accumulo writes for the tables that Timely maintains its metrics in. We've brought it down to two or even one in some cases. So uh, both of those have allowed us to um, consume the volume of metrics that we're looking for uh, regardless of, of durability. Bill, do you want to come on up and talk about the Grafana work? So uh, now that we have the data all into uh, Timely, we want to take a look at it and uh, experiment with that data to do some data mining. One of the ways that you can do that is in Grafana using alerts. Timely doesn't, Timely's data source doesn't currently support Grafana alerts. We're working on that under issue number 152. However, in looking at this, I found that the OpenTSDB data source would work for most of the Timely queries that I tried it on. So there you could set up alerts they're executed on the back end of the server, and you can send alerts via email, Slack, uh, custom webhook, with graphs attached sometimes. Uh, when it hits a minimum, maximum uh, of the, uh, when it's above or below, outside a range or inside a range, based on min, max, sum, count, and all those other things there. So that's useful, because that can look at the graphs as they're progressing, even when you can't have someone looking at them in person. <clears throat> what we did implement in Timely is a subscription API. This was mentioned last year during the presentation as something that was being worked on, and it's now completed, and we've implemented that and used it. So users can subscribe to metrics using WebSockets. They start with a unique subscription ID. That way you could have different subscriptions under the same channel. And each of the responses also has that subscription ID coming back so that you can demux those. This gives you the raw metrics. It doesn't uh, downsample. If you want to do downsampling, you still need to use the query API. <clears throat> so you start with creating um, a subscription with a unique ID, and then you add one or more metrics to that. You can remove them if you no longer need them, and then you close it. And the operations look something like this with a JSON notation. That's the uh, create and close, the opposites there. And then the add is a little more interesting, where you still use that unique ID. You have the metric, and then any of the tags that you want to filter on. The start time and end time are optional. If you don't include those, then you get all of the data for all of time. And the delay time is also interesting. Once you get up to your end time, or you get to the end of the data, 
then it will wait for that long in milliseconds until it returns and says, hey, I'm done with the data. Because this is a subscription, you could just hang on there, new data comes in, you keep getting data back out the WebSocket. And of course, remove is where you rip it down so you don't consume resources on the back end. <clears throat> uh, the response is exactly what you would expect. The metric, timestamp values, all of the tags that were included in the data, which sometimes can be quite a bit. And then uh, the subscription ID to DMUX, and then a complete false, so that, that lets you know when it's finally reached the end of the data, and you can start any follow-on analytic that you require. So with that WebSocket interface, we created a Python WebSocket based on the Tornado library using asynchronous callbacks, and then had a concrete class on top of that, timely metric class, which uses that API and implements the callbacks as data comes back. It's assembled into first a Python array and then eventually into a pandas data frame using a date time index. And that allows you to do downsampling uh, or resampling uh, and also the, the pandas data frame allows you to do pivoting on the data. The columns are going to be either the metric name or the tags name and the tag names, and it looks like a giant Excel spreadsheet if you were to print it out. <clears throat> so you can get all of that data back, and then we want to graph it or do alerts. <clears throat> so in order to do graphing, uh, I explored a number of different solutions and came up with Plotly using offline methods. So uh, Plotly can either do offline or online where it's hosted in a central server. And the pages that it generates are HTML JavaScript, which are really cool for exploring the data. You can hover over the different series, zoom in on them, zoom out on them, turn them on and off since it's a live sort of graph. And running your own custom analytics is um, it's a little better than Grafana because you can customize it more to isolate discrete anomalies, and we'll see that on the subsequent slides. If you plot all of the data, it can get confusing at times. In building this um, alerting system, one of the issues that we came across was inconsistent data or duplicate metric issues. Depending on which tags you pull back, you may have the same the uh, system, pandas, for instance, may think that you had duplicate data in there, and then you go to pivot, and it gets confused and errors out. So writing an analytic method for reuse across all of the different metrics that we want to take a look at uh, took a little bit of time. And determining how to isolate trigger events to figure out what's normal and what's abnormal in any case. <clears throat> Hopefully that's visible up there. Um, this is just an example of running the timely metric, pulling back all that data, and then running the analytic on it to find the alerts. Some of the things that are included here are a group by column, so that's the pivot. In this case, it's host. You could do also do rack or a type of host on your system. How you want to sample a mean or the minimum or the maximum and the sample time. In this case, it's five minutes. When you're actually gener when you're pulling back that data, you have to provide the host and the port, the metric, what tags you want to filter on, and begin, end, and duration in order to supply the time that you want to get it on, and a resample. <clears throat> now let's talk briefly about how to isolate aberrant data. If you're new on a system and you look at this first graph over here, these are the queued major compactions. So this is. A lot of data is being ingested here um, into a cumulo. We're monitoring cumulo in this case. And a lot of bulk imports are happening. So we have a lot, a lot of queued major compactions. And you might look at this and think, oh my gosh, they're spiking up to 50 queued major compactions in some case. But it comes right back down. Is that good or bad? Don't know. You look at the next day. This is the same rack of servers over a 24-hour period uh, on successive days. And the same thing is happening. So you might figure, I guess that's normal. So we're going to have to adjust our metric and our uh, analytic in order to figure out when something bad is going on. <clears throat> Some of the tools for doing that are looking at the min and the max, 
But then you have a problem when you have transient data because if it pops up to 50 briefly, it comes back down, probably not a problem. Uh, the analytic also provides our rolling average, which is configurable to provide a dampening effect there. And you can see if it goes above the rolling average or below the rolling average, um, above a maximum, if the rolling average goes above a max or below a minimum. And also a percentage above the rolling average. So if you take an average over the past 24 hours and if it goes 50% above that, then that will compensate for data that moves around a lot. If one day it's at 20, the next day it's at 40. If your data volume continues growing and you don't want to have to keep adjusting your metrics, then you can set it so that if it goes 50% above the last 24 hour average, then it'll send an alert. And then the minimum alert period, if it spikes for five minutes, might not be so bad in some cases. If it spikes for an hour, might want to take a look at that. The windowing effect allows you to only analyze the last 24 hours maybe, or the last six hours, maybe the last hour. That's so you don't have alerts that keep coming into your email from the past day or two days ago. So here's an anomalous condition that came up while I was doing slides. This is a cube major compaction that instead of hitting 40 or 50 as in the last one, hit 200, 250 for over an hour or greater than 30 minutes, actually, in this case. <clears throat> so the, the average went over 100 for greater than 30 minutes within the last hour, and it sent out an alert. And this is what it looks like when you're zoomed in. So the last frame is like that. But by running alerts every hour, we run the Python scripts on a cron job. You can catch it within the first 30 minutes or so, probably, of when it alerts. And Drew's gonna talk about Apache Flink. <clears throat> when we get a lot of data in, it's sometimes hard to pull back things that were on 60 minute samples. So if you wanna look in retrospective data, then summarizing it is probably a good idea. So by default, the way our systems are configured are, um, basically collecting a large variety of metrics on a per minute basis, right? So really, really fine grain data, uh, a large number of metrics at that level. And we retain data at this resolution for, for seven days. So, so the question is, is what happens when you need to run analytics on trends uh, across longer time periods? And to achieve this, we basically were looking at ways to automatically roll up data from minute resolution to half hour, 60 minute, half day resolution, something along those lines. And there were a lot of different options available to us. You know, you know, sort of like the natural choice is, is you know, Accumulo's aggregator mechanism, right? But with the amount of data that we had to, to roll up, uh, we really ran into a situation where the aggregations that were happening on the tablet servers uh, led to a lot of ingesting query uh, contentions. So it was not really possible for us to implement the roll-ups exclusively in Apache Accumulo, and we were looking at ways to do this externally with, uh, with a number of external systems. So we evaluated Storm and Kafka, and ultimately um, we ended up settling on the Flink Streaming API because of the flexibility uh, that it provided us with windowing, and this notion that processing time and event time are two distinct uh, components of analysis, and also the watermarking functions. So uh, long and short, uh, we used Apache Flink to consolidate data across a variety of different time windows uh, and, and uh, achieve the rollups that way. So the analytics summary job looks a little bit like this, where we have uh, a number of Flink, Flink sort of runs quite like a MapReduce job, except on streaming data. And you can have uh, bounded or unbounded processing in the sense that you could process a stream indefinitely, or you can sort of process a distinct time window. The way we're using Flink is actually a di processing distinct time windows uh, where basically a cron job kicks it off for a particular area that's moving close to the point in time where it would age off. A uh, number of Flink workers start up based on uh, the parallelism we've established for the job, and uh, each of them uh, read a chunk of the data uh, from uh, Timely via the read path that you see at the bottom of the screen, uh, once again going through HAProxy to balance between Timely servers. Uh, Flink provides the, pr performs the summary and then uh, writes the data back to the right path through HAProxy as well. 
This is all implemented. We, we have a flink rich source function that's implemented in the timely code base. There's a timely analytics project. So you can go to that uh, module in the timely uh, source code and see how it's done. So long and short, we have a summary job, uses the WebSocket API subscription source. We can summarize multiple metrics simultaneously and collect these windows in Flink and then flush them all back to Timely as the windows complete. This allows us to do a variety of different aggregations, not just the min-max standard sort of things, but also percentiles so we can understand how our data behaves in a more detailed way. Um, sort of tongue in cheek, I, I say we're storing the values in these metrics as doubles. Um, that probably, that's probably not large enough for some of the things we're dealing with. So one of the things we need to look at uh, later on is probably uh, storing uh, metrics at a variety of orders of magnitude. So now we'll talk through some of the lessons learned uh, in the architecture of this, of this process. So the first lessons learned um, are about our architecture. Collecting metrics um, are configured uh, through the creation file and has read threads and write threads. So the read threads are what are used to read over the source plugins and if some of those are slow, then you might have a lag there, you might need to up your read threads. Write threads is what we ran into recently, that the queue is building up, we were getting metrics on our metrics actually, and saw that the collectee queue was building up and it was throwing away random metrics at the top. So it hits its maximum threshold and then starts randomly just ditching metrics in order to not get overrun. And there was actually um, synchronization going on in our plugin, our write plugin. And even though we had multiple write threads, it was synchronizing around the same socket. So we had to rewrite it in order to use multiple sockets for each write thread in order to make it actually use those threads. <clears throat> and that was taken care of on issue 156. And HA proxy doesn't handle UDP connections. So we had configured one of our systems to throw UDP packets at HA proxy, hoping that they'll go to timely, and they were just getting discarded because it wasn't actually routing UDP. And Nginx is a possible solution there as a possible workaround, and I'm sure there are others. The NSQ pipe process that Drew talked about that pulls off of the pipe and throws it into timely, um, the one that we wrote only connected once, so you need to make sure that if your timely goes down that it connected to through HA proxy, that it has a some sort of failure mechanism. If that one goes down, that it um, reconnects and finds a different Timely. And of course, monitor your ingest and query performance using Timely's internal metrics, using Grafana or your other favorite um, interface. So this gets to actually aging off the data. We ran into some interesting um, cases where we would fill up HDFS pretty readily. Uh, metrics are good at doing that. So uh, looking at ways in which uh, Cumulus should be configured to properly age off data in a rapid fashion. Um, it, the compaction ratio was something that was tricky to get right. We had to adjust that a number of different times to make sure that we weren't uh, completely bogging the system down with compactions, but still getting the data age off. Uh, eventually, kicking uh, compactions off by hand using full table compactions worked pretty well. Uh, and then also just making sure HDFS is tuned appropriately. Uh, a great example that we ran into was uh, we had an HDFS cluster where we thought it was a known quantity, but unfortunately it wasn't configured appropriately to write to a number of different spindles. It was only using one drive on each of the machines. So uh, IOSTAT is your friend at tracking <laughs> issues like that. And we definitely ran into situations where a single spindle wasn't enough to, to handle the right load we were dealing with. And then a review and call your metrics, right? Um, out of the box, collect D can collect an amazing variety of metrics, but you really don't need to be tracking your packet errors on your loopback interface. Um, so make sure that you spend an, an, an ordinate amount of time uh, uh, configuring collect D to, to collect and measure what you really, really want, right? So, and then just to, to Bill's point, it's like, you know, use collect D, I mean, use Timely to monitor its own collect D performance so you understand what's going on. So, you know, look at metrics using your metrics. And, and that's it. Uh, let's go ahead and take some questions if anybody has them. Yes, absolutely. So typically what we'll do for an operational system is reserve a rack or something along those lines to, to collect metrics. And it's, a, it's isolated HDFS, isolated Accumulo, 
Zookeeper, nothing shared with the actual production incidents that we're, they're trying to monitor. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So a lot of the cases when we will store strings or enumerations, we try to work something along those lines into the tag structure that we're writing. So we didn't cover this in this presentation, but essentially what you're dealing with is a single metric is going to be a metric name, a metric value, a metric timestamp, and then a number of different tags that are associated with that metric. And, and commonly we'll use tags for like host or rack or some other as aspect of the data. It's very useful for doing rollups across different dimensions for the same metric. But in other cases, you can take a value that's a string value, put that actually in the metric tag, and then just use a value of one or something like that if you're just counting the number of occurrences of a particular event or something along those lines. Anyone else? All right, thank you guys very much.